Welcome to The Art of Liberty, the unauthorized radical libertarian podcast with George Donnelly and John Tyner. If you want to maximize your freedom in the real world today, this is the podcast for you. Today is Monday, July 8th, 2013, and our topic is Advice for a Young Libertarian. Hi, John. How are you today? I'm doing good. How are you doing, George? I am feeling spectacular. <laughs> I know I said this before, but I love talking to you because you always you're always feeling good or spectacular or something. You know, it, always... it's easy. It's easier. It's a little bit easier when you live in the land of the eternal spring. <laughs> well, uh, there's always nice there, I guess. Yeah, yeah. This is where I live. is is called the city of the eternal spring, and um, you know, it's always springtime weather year round. It's you know, lately it's been getting kind of cold at night uh, in the 50s, but uh, during the day it doesn't usually get above about 85, and that's year-round. Wow. So, yeah. so it's, I guess you're uh, right there on the equator. Yeah, I'm a little bit above the equator, yeah. And we're, uh, the altitude here is about, um, about 4,500 or 5,000 feet. Okay. So, so, you know, you get the warmth, but then you get the cold from being at a high altitude. Do you stay out of the humidity there too? Yeah, no humidity. No, it's awesome. zero. I mean, not zero, but it's never uncomfortable in terms of humidity. Yeah. And um, it's uh, a valley, a long, thin valley between two giant mountain ranges. Uh, and so you can, uh, you know, depending on how uh, warm you like it, you know, if you like to be, you know, really hot, like a little sweaty, you know, you can go and live down at the in the base of the valley. <laughs> but if you, but if like me, you like to be a little bit cooler, you can live a little bit higher up on the side of the mountain. So nice. yeah, so it's uh, it's really unique, you know, for somebody like me who was born, uh, you know, and and lived the first twenty six years of my life between uh, you know Philadelphia and Chicago. Uh, you know, I mean, that's flat. That's all flat land there, practically. Uh, it's really uh, fascinating to, yeah. to live like this. So have you convinced the uh, government there to offer uh, Edward Snowden asylum so he can come live with you in that weather? <laughs> I wish. Uh, the government <laughs> here, sadly, this is basically a client state of the U.S., um, you know, and it's perhaps the most conservative or most rightist government, you know, at a time in Latin or South America, at least, where you have people like Morales in Bolivia, you have the whole Venezuela thing, you have Correa in Ecuador, uh, and here I got a, a right wing guy, you know, half halfway fascist type. Bummer. Yeah, yeah, I saw I saw a couple more countries in South America had offered him asylum, so I figured maybe Colombia was coming soon. I wish, I wish he could come and stay with us, you know, for as long as he liked. Um, but uh, no such luck, you know. They they regularly here they regularly um, extradite their own citizens to the United oh, States to- for drug charges. Uh, wow, it's just insane the level at which the the country's elite, the uh, oligop oligopoly or the oligarchy, yeah, have sold out the country, um, you know, over the whole drugs thing, uh, and the way that they're parceling out um, the amazing and unique uh, natural resources here to foreign corporations is is just utterly disgusting. Wow. Yeah. So, do you, have you heard any more about where he is? I thought it was interesting because um, he's supposed to be, you know, in this Moscow airport. But I was listening to a story the other day that said basically nobody can find him. Yeah, isn't that strange? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I heard of. They said there's some kind of hotel or something that's attached to the Moscow. Not attached, but like I guess the police basically take you from this airport area to this hotel and then basically stand guard at the hotel. So it's called the prison hotel, I guess. But, oh, really? I yeah, heard. I saw some. I saw some story that said the Moscow airport, like the second floor of this, you know, limbo area where he is, mm-hmm. is basically a refugee camp. You know, there's a bunch uh-huh. of people there in similar situations, and apparently there's some prison hotel that people can get ferried back and forth to. But it's like I said, it's basically a prison because the police stand guard won't let you basically leave your room. I, I heard that the capsule. It's a that there's maybe there's there too, but I heard there was a capsule hotel. Uh, inside that area that, I mean, it didn't require ferrying or anything. Yeah, I got uh, the impression this place I heard about required ferrying, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were just the same place. Huh. And um, But that they, early on, they went into the hotel and they asked if, um, 
you know, Edward uh, was staying there, but they, you know, the the guy at the desk claimed he wasn't. But where else, you know, either either he's in there and they're just, you know, the, the guy, the hotel guy doesn't want the attention or, uh, you know, Russian uh, intelligence have, uh, you know, have him. I mean, yeah, the, the report else could I was yeah, the report I was listening to said that they were even looking for, um, you know, like Pizza Hut or, you know, some local restaurant to be delivering food into the hotel. And they didn't even see anything like that to suggest that somebody was just holed up in the hotel. Yeah, it's yeah. And you so gotta wonder, was, you know, is, is he OK? Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, everybody everybody's looking for this guy and he can only really be, you know, according to reports, he can only really be in a very, fairly small area, but nobody can find him. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, from the beginning, when I heard that he went to Hong Kong, you know, I was, it was another facepalm moment for me. It was like, why? I mean, if, you know, you would think if you were going to go to that level, that you would put a little more thought and care into it. And you would go to a place like Iceland or Venezuela or um, Ecuador, you know, I mean, straight away. So, you, yeah. I mean, you know, how did he get himself into this, you know? Yeah, it, se it seemed kind of odd that he went to Hong Kong and said, here's one of these places I really wanted to go. You know, my first thought was, well, then why didn't you just go there? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, was he just not thinking right? I mean, was the whole stress, you know, just compromised his decision-making ability? I mean, what, what was going on Yeah, I don't know. It's, it, se it seemed like he had thought it through, at least from the, the stories I read about his um, – you know, his planning to leave Hawaii and everything. So I don't know what, what led him to leave there, live there, or move there, or fly there. Yeah. And he, I mean, he made a detailed case for why he thought uh, Hong Kong was a good idea. And if he really believed that, then why did he leave at the first sign of an extradition request? You know? Yeah. Well, it, se it seemed like Hong Kong may have been a good place to go, you know, 15, 20 years ago when they weren't under China rule. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I, don't, I don't even know. On. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know a whole lot about it then, but it just seemed like as being part of China's rule now, you know, just didn't seem like you know, may as well flown to mainland China somewhere. <laughs> at least he could have, you know, at least he could have gone into the countryside or hid out in Beijing among a billion people, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, although you know, I I think uh, in his shoes, I would have totally avoided any connection with China or Russia because not only is it banned from a PR angle, it looks like he's a traitor to the the state. But uh, they may very well want to grab him and uh, pump him for all the information that they can get. Yeah, that and it seems like they're neither one of those countries is on very good terms with the U.S. At it right now, it would actually be in their interest to, you know, as a show of goodwill or whatever, to capture him and send him back. Mm, yeah, I mean, after maybe, they maybe not Russia for information. Well, sure. Yeah. Russia seems like they're they, they're kind of want to thumb their nose at the U.S. a little bit about the whole thing, though. Yeah. Whereas a place like Venezuela, I mean, you know, I, I don't really like Chavez, but, uh, you know, they have tried to unseat that whole Chavez Maduro government kind of a thing for a long time. And yeah. they haven't been able to. So, I mean, there's, you know, I think for somebody, you know, who wants to play off the different states against each other, uh, I think that's a really good spot to go because – they are, you know, virulently against the U.S. there, and they have a really strong majority. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not likely that overnight that government is going to change into a government like you have in Colombia, where, I mean, they're basically a U.S. client state. Yeah. Did you – Did this kind of reminded me. Did you ever read about Sealand? Yeah. Uh-huh. And are the – um. It was, I think it was a year or two ago now, but I read the Volok Conspiracy, which is a blog by a bunch of lawyers who claim to be libertarian leaning. Right. And <laughs> they, they make me so angry. And I think it's just because they're lawyers, you know, like I think they tend to lean libertarian, but they also, you know, basically end up saying this is what the law says. Yeah. And the site just makes me angry because the two seem like they're always in conflict with each other. But anyway, um, they had a guest guy come on and he talked all about Sealand. And one of the things he brought up that I found really interesting was that. Sealand claimed to be outside the law, but every time it got into trouble, basically appealed to the law to protect itself. Mm. And I thought that was kind of interesting because it seemed like Snowden's kind of walking that tightrope trying to get his passport restored. 
Oh yeah, I haven't heard yeah. anything about that. What's he doing to? to well, get I don't it restored? know that he's trying to. Well, I don't know that he's trying to get it restored, but it just seemed kind of you know he, the U.S. took it away, and so then he kind of appealed to this the U.N. idea of this human right to travel and the human right to seek asylum. So basically, you know, one governing body screwed him, so he kind of tried to turn to this other quasi governing body to rescue him. Yeah. Of course, I mean, those are the powers that be at the moment. I mean, there is no uh, revolutionary agorist cadre or something which ha has, a, you know, the, the power to be like, you know, okay, we'll, we'll fix this situation for you. Right. Yeah, I just thought the whole the whole kind of idea was just kind of interesting. Like I said, I mean, the, the, the guy goes on and on in this article I read about Sealand, but it was just kind of an interesting thing. You know, on the one hand, you want to claim this government's illegitimate, you know, and maybe maybe Snowden isn't a voluntarist, but... It was, it was just kind of interesting to me to see him claim on one hand that this government had screwed him was illegitimate and then kind of appeal to some other governing body to protect him or set this first power right. Yeah, but I, I think that's a valid strategy to play governments off of each other. And frankly, when you're at the level, I mean, he's at a really high level of resistance there. I mean, what other choice do you have? I mean, oh, you know, yeah, every square inch of the planet practically uh, that's that's livable is cover is you know claimed by a you know a state um yeah i i'm not saying he's wrong to do so it's it's just an interesting thing for me to see the law kind of work you know or have two different conflicting powers kind of work against each other in that that sense yeah and i think we have to be you know uh savvy about that about using them against each other because that's you know that i think that's a good place to open up space for for some, for a non-state power entity. Yeah, and to your earlier point, it seems like it would have been good for him to go to some place that would have that would have taken him in and used, you know, basically been happy to use him as a playing chip or whatever you want to call it against the US. Yeah. Yeah, and right now Latin America or South America especially is really good for that. There's there's basically this big resurgence of this kind of, uh, you know, it's left socialism kind of stuff, but it's it's very anti-U.S., anti-imperialism, you know, anti-first world. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, you have to be – it's, you know, it's almost real politic, uh, you know. I mean, you, you – at this level, you have to engage in that. Yeah. So have you been following then what's going on in Egypt? Yes. Mm -hmm. I've seen you post a couple of things. I've only read a few stories here and there, but I I haven't really been following it. But I thought it might be interesting to spend a couple of minutes talking about that real quick. Apparently, the you know after all the the hubbub a year or so ago, um, the Egyptian sorry the Muslim Brotherhood got into power. They got control of the government, democratically and, elected, and everything. Yeah, imagine that. And uh, and they started doing stuff that people didn't like. And so uh, even bigger protests have been going on the last few days. Uh, people estimated them at between 12 and 33 million people out on the streets across the country. And um, so basically with the assistance of the Egyptian military, once again, uh, they have kicked the, the Muslim Brotherhood out of uh, power. And so um, now the Muslim Brotherhood, I saw some um, claims and, and actually photos that their individual partisans were going out with guns and shooting protesters. Yeah, I saw something about that. So were these Brotherhood guys, were they were they doing stuff that people didn't like, or did they basically just come into power and forget to restore democracy and just go about doing their own thing? Well, apparently they, they had a new constitution. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly why people are, are upset with them, frankly. Yeah. I'm just, I just really like it that, you know, that they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least as at least as far as states and governments go, it seemed to, it seemed interesting to me that yeah, you know, the people people, you know, basically deposed Mubarak and used the you know, used the military to do so. Um it's I don't know a lot about Egypt's politics, but it seemed interesting slash odd slash dangerous to me that the military came in, deposed him, they put in this new government, and then when the people got angry enough, the military basically came in and got rid of this new group of people. Yeah, and, it's uh, it's not a good precedent, really. No, and it seems like you know after a while the military, you know, I like I said, I don't know what their politics look like, but it seems like at some point the military ought to just be like, you know, what, we're tired of coming in and and putting some guy in power and having him booted out. We're just going to do it. 
You know, it seems yeah. like they kind of see themselves as this neutral third party who whenever the people in the government can't get along, they basically come in and get rid of the government and then let the people install somebody new. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that, at that one seems point, like a, it that, seems like a good way to go, you know, like if they're a neutral third party, but they're people too, you know, at some point they're not going to be a neutral third party anymore. Yeah. At what point, at what, at what point are they going to install a military dictatorship? Right. Right. Just in the name of law and order. Because right. when you have 33 million people out on the streets, I mean, how much business is taking place, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that was just – it seemed like a dangerous situation. And, you know, maybe the, maybe it'll – they'll come out of it with another democratic government. Although, you know, James Babb I saw posted something on Facebook that said the lesson from 1776 should have been once you depose your government, don't replace it. Yeah. <laughs> and actually there was uh, um, a an effort to – uh, that I thought was uh, an interesting active digital activism effort. Some friends of mine they were went onto Twitter and they were looking for tweets from people in Egypt, and they would respond with information about um, the stateless society, the idea of a stateless society, encouraging mm-hmm. uh, people in Egypt to look at it for themselves and establish a stateless Egypt. Yeah, it seems like they've got a real opportunity to do so. You know, it's not every day that people get out in the streets and depose their governments. Yeah, and that that's that sparked an idea that I blogged about last week about uh, setting up a team where we could, on the drop of a hat, you know, if there's a situation like what there is in Turkey or you know in Egypt or uh, in a U.S. city or whatnot, uh, send a, a team of people out there with uh, you know literature and you know to run training courses and things like um, you know nonviolence and. Uh, you know, what, how does the stateless society work and all this stuff. And, you know, basically like a, like an evolution in a box um, and, you know, go out to, you know, where, where people are looking, actively looking for alternatives and, you know, put all the information they need into their hands. Did you get a lot of good response to that? Just a little bit. I, I posted it uh, Friday, which was the day after, um, you know, Independence Day. So I think a, a lot of people weren't, uh, just weren't online. You mean the 4th of July? <laughs> Dependence Day, as I've seen it called? Yeah. Yeah, but it, so, is, it, uh, it is Independence Day or Secession Day, however you like to look at it, perhaps. Yeah, at least it was way back then. So uh-huh. I didn't want – I didn't want. I don't want listeners to think that uh, that we're just going to shill for your, your business here. But I was curious if you would talk a little bit about Shield Mutual just for a minute about what kind of the main idea behind that is. I mean now that we've started doing this, I mean I've been thinking about joining up. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I was thought, you know, it might be good for you to spend a minute or two and just kind of talk about what it is that's all about. So like okay. I said, I didn't, I didn't want, I don't want the listeners to think that we're here to just shill for you for your business here. I mean, you had no idea I was going to ask you this, but if you want to talk about it for a minute, I think that would be good. At least just, if not just for me. Well, I, I, I certainly plan in the future to shill for my businesses and products. <laughs> Well, yeah, which which is fine, but uh, you know, I think I, I have no problem doing that if the listeners know that we're going to shill and do that for your businesses and products. So I just, at least in this instance, it wasn't intended by you, at least. So I, I don't think there should be any shame in selling things that generally add value to people's lives. But um, well, okay. all right. So tell us how it adds value then. Yeah. So Shield Mutual is the Agora's first defense agency, and basically. Um, you know, as part of the the stateless uh, libertarian society that people have been theorizing about for a while now, the idea is that over time we're going to grow a power base outside of the government sphere, uh, people trading agoristically, counter economics, um, and you know, not not paying taxes, not registering these kinds of a things, these kinds of things, um, and at some point. Uh, in order to displace the state, you know, because the state's going to get weaker as we our non-state sphere grows, we are going to need a defense agency or various defense agencies to basically uh, stop the state enforcers when they come to put us in prison or make us pay taxes or make us register our businesses or whatever. And the idea is that, you know, this defense agency is going to have guns and whatnot. Well, I was thinking about how to get us to that stage faster and uh, I thought, you know, we should start a defense agency that uses not the force of guns, but the force of truth, uh, leadership, uh, publicity, um, proactive um, platform building for individual activists. So basically, that's what Shield Mutual does. We're a defense agency 
But we don't use guns. We use the force of truth and publicity and whatnot to defend you when the police come down on you, when an act of aggression is committed against you. Um, and so from $50 per year, which is really uh, the price, less than the price of a latte. So it's, I mean, it's basically, you know, couch under the cushions money. Um, you know, you can get protected from uh, aggression. Um, and we've already had a lot of excess, uh, success with this. And in our next evolution, which is coming up in a few days, we are going to have uh, tools for our customers to proactively build their, their platforms, uh, not just for them personally as activists and individuals, but also for their small businesses. Interesting. Well, that's, that's my mouthful for that. Cool. Yeah, I had no idea that you intended to evolve to a full-up defense agency at some point in the future. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know at, one po at what point that will make sense. And me being, you know, a, a kind of a Gandhian guy, you know, a Satyagrahi uh, yeah. guy who believes in uh, that it's, you know, more effective and more, you know, makes more sense to use the force of truth instead of the force of arms. I don't know if I would ever want to operate, uh, you know, a defense agency that sends out armed patrols. Uh, uh -huh. I may leave that to somebody else or, okay. you know, I, I, I don't know. But I do know at this time in our, in our evolution as a community that it's much too early for that. Um, but um, that it is the right time. For this, because we can, uh, we are, we have individuals across the world who are individually, um, you know, isolated to one extent or another, and who are being attacked, you know, and threatened, you know, in the case of uh, one activist in New Hampshire recently, with uh, threatened with 81 years in, in prison, just for uh, dealing supposedly, allegedly, in a plant, marijuana. And right. uh, when they come down on you with their full force, and you you know, are isolated or even just have support from your local community, uh, that puts you at a disadvantage. But we have a global network that is constantly growing. And, um, you know, we have the public relations, the leadership, the IT skills to, uh, you know, just kick ass, um, you know, on a, on a, you know, on a press level um, for you and on a, on a large level. Using well, the power of the internet. Seemed like you did a pretty good job with uh, Adam Kokesh's uh, recent arrest also. I mean, you were able to gather a bunch of people together and raise up some uh, legal funds for him pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I was uh, kind of surprised. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I set up a website uh, for the effort to free him because he was in prison for six days in May on charges of a uh, federal felony. And in those six days, 28,000 unique visitors visited that website. And wow. then, yeah, and then there was an email list, there was Twitter, there was Facebook. Um, we did a call flood the day, two days after he was arrested. And we basically shut down the federal government in Philadelphia uh, for that day. And a couple days later, uh, you know, Adam's representatives on the outside uh, decided um, to, uh, you know, agree to my suggestion of setting up a legal fund. And in 11 hours, we raised uh, $6,300. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I liked that face on the, the page on Facebook even. And then I had people just that I interact with on a daily basis who follow me or I'm friends with on Facebook who are like, hey, what's the deal with this Adam Kokesh guy? So, I mean, even just setting that up and having people like that opened up, you know, a lot of people who may not might not have even heard about his story at all, mm -hmm. you know, started asking me. And I'm sure this happened all over the place, started asking their friends, hey, what's the deal with this guy? Yeah, and uh, you know, before Adam was arrested, um, he had a he has a, fa um, a Facebook page. It's pretty popular. I think he had around forty or forty five thousand likes, and he's at uh -huh. uh, afterwards he had fifty five thousand, and now of course he has seventy thousand. I mean, he's trending upwards in a big way. Right, and even a guy like Adam who has a big network, uh, you know, you have to understand. I think that most people are not really leaders, sadly. Most people are pretty passive. And so when you have uh, people who are leaders like we have at Shield Mutual, uh, you know, we're not afraid to go out there and tell the truth. I mean, we issued a press release saying that he had been framed, which was the absolute truth. Um, and so, and you know, it takes that kind of leadership. I mean, nobody else organized a call flood. 
Uh, and we did. And, you know, when you, when you do things like that, you issue the press releases, set up the call flood, set up the website, you know, tweet out the truth, the unabashed truth. That, that focuses, um, you know, all these people in a laser-like way that is the most effective. Yeah. So I know that I know this probably ends up sounding like an ad for Shield Mutual, but I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to dig through my couch cushions and find myself 50 bucks to send to you. So <laughs> you could look for that in the next few days. Or it might take a little longer to dig through my couch cushions. But <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I hope I hope the listeners don't think that we intended to come on and do an ad for your for your business. But I don't actually care if they do or not. <laughs> All right. Well, like, like I said, if, we, if we're going to tell them we're going to do an ad, then that's fine with me. I just think we ought to, you know, I didn't intend to do that. All right. You know, we didn't set out to do that at least. I don't think we should apologize for something like this because it, basically, uh, you know, when you create, if you create a service that people want to buy um, and people do want to buy, I mean, my, the membership has been going up a lot recently. Then you're, I mean, you're doing a public service, but because you're giving people more than, than they're giving you. I mean, that's the def- definition of a free market trade, really. Yeah. So you had pointed out this story on Reddit about some guy who was looking for advice. It seems like since you're running this Shield Mutual thing, it seems like that might be a good, uh, you might have some good advice for him. <laughs> yeah, so there's a post on the Libertarian subreddit that I thought was interesting. Um, and here, here it is. It says, uh, I'm 17. I have strong liber- a, a strong libertarian lean to my beliefs. I loathe the current state of our bloated government, but how can we make a difference? Does anyone have any suggestions on which libertarian parties are strongest, most influential, have the best shot at putting a candidate in any kind of office? Do I have a better shot of making a change in government by compromising and voting Tea Party or find a small government Republican to vote for? I'm so frustrated reading this subreddit and the news, and I want things to change, but I don't know with whom or where to get involved as a libertarian. So for our readers, our listeners, I think it would be interesting you know, for you to think about, um, you know, what you might say, I mean, this this is a young libertarian just getting started out. I mean, he's 17. What would you say to this person, you know? And maybe you could so, give us a call, you know, and leave us a voicemail with your question. Uh, with people your still comments. not calling in. You know, I think uh, the phone system must be down across the whole planet, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe someone could call in with a question. And, uh, you know, just so we can know whether it's working or not. Maybe it's just that our three listeners don't have phones. (laughs) Yeah, that's our demographic. (laughs) Our demographic is homeless people who can't afford disposable cell phones. (laughs) But they've got internet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, speaking of disposable cell phones, or just this tiny tangent, I saw I was watching a trailer for a a new Haley Berry movie last night and uh in it uh women are getting kidnapped and murdered you know by the serial killer and a woman gets captured and thrown into a trunk and she calls on her cell phone to 911 and Haley Berry who's the 911 operator she's like oh my god the phone it's a disposable there's no chip i can't know where this person is <laughs> and i'm like what the hell that's government propaganda right there <laughs> They're just trying to lie to you and be like, oh, we can't do anything about this. Yeah, if you have a disposable cell phone, according to this government propaganda in a Hollywood movie, then they can't figure out where you are. 911 yeah. can't figure out where you are. And that, I just thought that was utterly ridiculous and false. But anyway, for those of you who would like to call in, it's 641 715 3900, extension 255888. This guy's question reminds me of a quote I keep seeing pop up recently that basically, I can't remember who said it, but it's basically that it's too late to work within the system, but it's too early to shoot the bastards. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's some, I think it starts out with, you know, the United States is just at this awkward stage, and that's that's basically how they described it. And that reminds me of the uh, Malcolm X uh, ballot or bullet speech. I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with that, so... I'm Which is sorry, uh, sad it, to say. It's a constant or question. To say. Yeah, but no, but it's a constant question that comes up. You know, people, and it's a false dichotomy. People are like, you know, okay, should I be voting 
or should I be out there shooting the bastards? You know? Right. Yeah. And it's totally a false dichotomy. There's, there is a third way that doesn't involve voting, which is, uh, you know, I mean, at best, uh, you know, it gives you a very weak and remote chance of doing anything useful and shooting, which is utterly self-destructive and not helpful. Yeah, well, and I think even you said, and I see a lot of people say this, is that revolutions are, they're not, they're not easy. They're not, it's not just you go in and shoot the guys and install something new. I mean, it's, it's very um, unpredictable. Yeah, I mean, you know, look at Egypt. I mean, they had to bring out tens of millions of people and it still didn't go off right the first time. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. look at it's... I mean, I remember seeing reports about all the uh economic production that was lost the first time. I mean, that uh-huh. that's an you know, that that first one happened at an incredibly expensive cost, you know? I don't know how people are surviving there, um frankly. And then uh, and then, you know, they have to do it again. I mean, how many times are they going to, you know, are they going to have to do it? Right. And well, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier where the military comes in and they're like, all right, you guys don't like this government. Great. We'll take it out here and you can try again. <laughs> you know, at, at some point, if you're going to have a democracy, you've kind of got to take the good with the bad. I mean, that's the way it goes. Mm, well, you know, I mean, well, I mean, like you can't have the military come in and just depose the government every time it passes some law or does something you don't like. I mean, like I said, I don't follow Egyptian politics as much as you know, well enough to talk, you know, incredibly intelligently about this, Mm. but you know, it's, so I don't know how bad it really is as far as what the Muslim brotherhood has been doing there, but you know, it's, it, you know, to, to liken it to living in the U S I mean, you don't have the military come out and depose the government and replace it whenever they pass a law you don't like kind of thing. Well, you know, at at some point you kind of just got to take the, you know, the stuff you don't like. I mean, if you're going to have a government, that's kind of the way it works. (laughs) Well, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I think that the the people who are vying for control of the state machine in Egypt have just learned a really valuable lesson. They don't have anything. I mean, they can occupy all the posts in the state, in the government, but they don't have anything unless they control the military. And so the next evolution of their, uh, you know, their program for control is, get control of the military, you know? Right. Well, it it's, it's political power is very interesting to me in that regard, because I mean, at some point you can go and replace all the military, but aren't you going to find if the military stands up and says, Hey, we're being replaced because we deposed the last government. And then you have the people step in and say, Hey, we don't like this because I'm so far, at least the military has been on our side. It's, would that be enough to stop them from replacing the military? I mean, I got to imagine the guys in the military now aren't going to be very happy if they get replaced. Yeah. And then, you know, look at what they did in, in Iraq. The, the U S government did there. They were like, um, they did that. They replaced the military. They went in, they were like, you know, this whole military, every government servant, everybody in the government is compromised. Ciao, get out. And so they created a, a civil war. And so if uh, the next Egyptian uh, government administration goes in and they're like, you know, okay, time to defund the military, start a new one, you know, fire everybody, et cetera, they're just going to create a huge civil war. Right. Well, and the military's got all the guns. It wouldn't take long for them to just take out the civilian government and <laughs> start over again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even in Syria, uh, a considerable whole units, uh, you know, defected, have defected from the government side to the to the other side. And now they have a civil war. Yeah. Which is, uh, so, t- you know, terrible. So back to this guy's question, um, I thought it was interesting that he actually suggested the Libertarian Party because um, after my whole TSA dust up, somehow I got on two or three Libertarian Party lists. Like I'm on the local one here in San Diego, and then I get stuff every once in a while from the National Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. And I keep wanting to opt out, but at the same time, I just kind of find – they don't send me emails. You know, it's once a week or something like that. So at least I can kind of see what it is they're doing and what they're pushing at any given time. Mm -hmm. Um, and after the defense of marriage thing happened last week, or I think it was two weeks ago now, um, I got emails from the local one and then from the national one last week. And they're basically like, oh yeah, we've been for this thing all along, you know, for marriage equality. And I was just sitting there thinking to myself, even the libertarian party's got it wrong. You know, the push shouldn't be to get 
everybody recognized by the government, the pro the push should be to get the government to get out of it entirely. Mm. You know, yeah. and so, I mean, even the Libertarian Party was just making me angry in that regard. So, I mean, to see this guy ask, oh, should I get involved in the Libertarian Party? It's, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even suggest the Libertarian Party, you know. Neither would I. Uh, and I, I was involved briefly uh, with the Libertarian Party. And I have to say it is a complete disaster. It is a waste of time. And um, it will, you know, it regularly burns good people out. On all the the stupidity that happens inside of there, um, you know, stay away from the Libertarian Party. It, it, it's yeah. it's just going to crush your spirit, you know. I, you can probably correct me since you've got a couple years on me, but I I read that Murray Rothbard, if not if did you know, either he founded it or was at least influential or part of the founding of the Libertarian Party. And from what I've read, it seemed like the thrust of the party when it started was supposed to be educational. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to put a candidate out there and we're going to basically um, espouse libertarian ideals, but we don't ever really intend to get elected. Yeah. And it seems like at some point it changed from being it changed from being an educational apparatus to one where they were actually trying to get elected. And so you see these positions being watered down in order to try and get people elected. Mm hmm. But yeah. even here in San Diego, there was an open assembly seat not too long ago, and I got emails regularly from the the local party chair. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, oh, we're going to run this person. And I think that person ended up getting like 3 or 4% of the vote. And I got an email afterwards. It was like, oh, we did so great. We got 3 or 4% of the vote. And I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. My, you know, I... They, you know, they have elected people to certain offices across the country, but it's always at a really low level. And even there is a uh, libertarian state senator in New Hampshire that was one of the, you know, their great successes. But the guy is not really a libertarian. I, I know new uh, free state project people in New Hampshire who ran as Republicans and got elected. Uh -huh. Who are more radical than this guy who is, uh, you know, uh, a, a libertarian, you know. So what's the claim to fame there that they got somebody elected who actually claims to be a libertarian? Mm hmm. Yeah. Like, I guess, you know, it's, it does. It seems to me like it doesn't matter what your party affiliation is. It matters once you what you do, if you once want if and once you actually get into office. Well, the thing is, it's so hard to get somebody other than a Democrat and Republican elected. That, um, you know, it is a legitimate feather in their cap to say that they overcame the two-party uh, duopoly there and got somebody in. And that's okay. not the only example, you know. But the fact is that, um, you know, the there, there are uh, two major wings in the Libertarian Party. There are the people who are uh, want to reform government. You know, they just want to make it a, a kinder, a kinder, gentler fascism. And then there <laughs> are the radicals. <laughs> who are do-nothings. Uh, you know, when I started to get involved with the Radical Caucus in, I think it was 2006, 7, 8, you know, I'd be like, hey, you know, they, they, they would always be like, oh, we're out of power and the reformers always kicking their butts and we can't win anything. And I'm like, okay, let's try this, you know? I'd be like right. suggesting an action plan and, you know, crick it would either be crickets or be like, nah, that would never work, you know? <sighs> And uh, so it was just like this whole defeatist attitude. And, um, you know, I, when I became an anarchist in 2009, I finally, you know, just threw that away, um, you know, just gave up on that because it was so, you know, it's either uh, a libertarianism that is so washed down and it's, it's, not, it's not about the principles. It's about, you know, getting elected, you know, whatever that may mean. Or it's a radicalism that is uh, defeated in its own mind, um, you know. And you know, any effort to reclaim it has to go up against both of those things. You know, it has to get past the reformers, who uh, are totally against the radicals, and it has to get past all the radical self hate. Because you know, you get in like, "Hey, I'm a radical. Let's do something." And then everybody's like, "Oh, you're not. A, you're not my kind of radical." And, yeah, you're not my kind of record. I, I think your ideas are bad, you know. And so, I mean, it's – and that's that's inherent in the whole democracy thing, you know. So that's why I'm a fan of direct action and that's why I recommend it to this young libertarian.
Yeah, the, the whole idea of getting into government as a libertarian, it just it seems backwards to me, too. You know, you want to get into power for the sole purpose of relinquishing that power. Yeah, and, and I'm not and I'm not sure it's going to work unless you can replace some huge portion of the apparatus all at once. You know, it's it's you've got so many people there who are there exactly because they want to seize the reins of power and control the state apparatus. You know, as one person, there's not a lot you can do. And I think, um, at least within that system, and I think, I think we talked about it a couple episodes ago, but I saw Jeffrey Tucker post something and he basically said, you know, electing somebody to government with the idea that they're going to, you know, reduce the state power is basically like electing a CEO to drive the share price of a company down. <laughs> you know, it's just not done. That's not the job. Mm. Well, I mean, even look at Ron Paul, uh, you know, he was, you know, I mean, he is, you know, libertarianism, oh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and um, I mean, he, in order for him to stay there for so long, he in, he had to engage in all this, um, what are they called? You know, it's like pork barrel spending, you know, the earmarks, the earmarks. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the consistent libertarian should have been. Uh, well, some some would disagree with this, but I think a consistent libertarian, and even Dr. Paul, I mean, he's Dr. No, you know, he should have been voting no, no, no on everything. Well, well, and he did, didn't he? I mean, he would earmark that stuff for his constituents, but then vote no on the budget bill that actually brought it home. And that's really cute. I mean, that's, you know, it's like, oh, Dr. Paul, you're so cute, <laughs> you know? But I mean, the fact is that he worked really hard to get all that stuff ahead of time, and he knew that everybody was going to vote for it, you know? So, I mean, that's not, I don't consider that like a, a meaningful vote, you know? That's a technicality. Yeah, and it's 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 an interesting problem, and I think it's just it's the, kind of the the nature of being in that position. You know, if your your job is, you know, he had a justification for it, which is, you know, the the people are paying taxes, so it's kind of his job to make sure that as much money as he as he can stays in the state or goes back to those people through whatever government services are available. And but that's what just, keeps it going because right. everybody's like, well, I want my share of it. And I'm like, no, but I want my share of it for this other thing. And, and no, but me, I want my share for this other thing, you know, and that's how we right. get and, the government we have. Right. And the problem, like, and this kind of goes back to the whole marriage thing. The problem isn't making sure everybody gets their share. The, you know, the idea should be that nobody has a share taken from them in the first place. Yeah. But it's like I said, it's just kind of an interesting position to put yourself in as a libertarian. Like you said, you can't really be a consistent libertarian there. If you're if you're working with this system that steals money from people, even if you're trying to give it back to them at the end of the day, you know, I kind of likened it to Robin Hood. You know, the guy steals from the rich and gives to the poor and everybody seems to like that. But the fact is, he's still stealing from people. <laughs> Although you could say that in the case of Robin Hood, what the the rich had acquired their wealth um, in a way that is not legitimate. And so he was, um, you know, kind of like uh, I, you haven't read Atlas Shrugged, but. In Atlas Shrugged, there's a character called Ragnar Daniskjold, and his whole function is to go and uh, steal uh, resources and wealth and whatnot from governments that has been stolen from individuals. And he keeps a log of all the, you know, all the things that he's stolen of who it's owed to, and he returns that wealth. So if we're going to defend, if we're going to defend Robin Hood, though, then shouldn't we be defending Ron Paul more? Or shouldn't you be defending Ron Paul? I mean, isn't he doing the same thing? But is he or returning he? those months, those funds to individuals? Or is he returning those funds to corporations who hire people in his area? All right, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Or military, even military bases. I mean, haven't some of his, some of the things he worked on have been to kept to keep military bases open in his district? I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe a Ron Paul fan can, uh, you know, call in. I mean, don't all call in. I mean, I know you guys are alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's they are legion, so be careful yeah, what just you wish for. Select the top five, please. You know. So I, mean, I don't. I don't know that we've actually given this guy advice so much as telling him don't get involved in politics because, like I said, he, you know, he asked about the Tea Party, and the only thing I tell people about that is, you know, choosing the lesser of two evils is still choosing evil. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of my that's kind of my uh, warning against getting involved in politics. Yeah, basically, all the options that he named in his post are political, and so I, you know, he may not be aware that there are other options. 
And so I would, I, I'm, I'll post a comment to him, um, you know, after we're done here, encouraging him to look into direct action and dual power. And basically, direct, direct action, agorism, counter-economics is a form of direct action. And basically, it's where you go out independently or working with other people, but outside the government sphere, and you create the things that you would like to see. So, for example, uh, Food Not Bombs is um, a group that instead of legislating for the government to spend more money uh, to feed people, they go out and they pick up excess food that might be thrown away or even is donated, and they just go out and they cook, cook it up and they feed it directly to people. That's an example of direct action. And dual power is a really fascinating concept. I think agorism, counter-economics, it's actually like an ANCAP version of dual power. I mean, like a watered-down version of dual power. Dual power is the idea that we're going to build up institutions outside the government sphere, uh, like uh, cooperatives, uh, mutuals, uh, small business, things like that, that will develop a second power base that can eventually uh, challenge and displace and overshadow the government sphere until such time that, uh, you know, our power is great enough that we can basically, um, you know, our power and our numbers are great enough that we can basically either starve the government or just shut it down forcefully. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that. I mean, I've, I'm kind of familiar with the idea just through agorism that eventually, you know, you can get so many people using those services that government services and just basically become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I heard about dual power after I heard about agorism. And, you know, as far as I can tell, maybe some agorist experts can come in and contradict me. Uh, by leaving a message, uh, you know, on our voicemail. But basically, my impression is that somebody just went and took dual power and, you know, developed a specific anarcho-capitalist uh, strategy, you know, in the dual power vein. Because dual power is so much bigger than just agorism. Yeah. So when you go leave this comment on, on Reddit, make sure you shill for the podcast and for your business. <laughs> <laughs> I would get downvoted to oblivion for that. I can oh, assure so people you. People don't like people don't like the ads there. Reddit <laughs> is, uh, Reddit is so finicky about these things. You know, it's 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 hit or miss. Sometimes I post things that I think are going to just wow them and yeah. it gets downvoted to oblivion and I get flamed and everything. And sometimes I post things that I'm like, "Ah, eh, you know, I'll just post it and see." But I don't have any great hopes for it. And it gets like voted up, you know, to 500 points or whatever. People are like, wow, you know, where'd that come from? You know, yeah, like I, I'm not, I'm, I don't have an account on Reddit. I just kind of, I read it when people are like, oh, here's this interesting thing going on here. You don't have an account on Reddit? No. Should I? Yes. Yes. My account, I've had my account since almost, you know, uh, when it started about six years ago. And yeah. um, it is just, um, it is really spectacular because, um, you know, just a simple way, it's so easy to just go in and browse uh, new information. And the community is so huge that it's updated so frequently with the latest stuff. And Yeah, maybe I should do that and start getting my news from there then. Generally, generally the comments are intelligent. Not always, but generally <laughs> the, the quality of commenting is pretty good. Um, although not from a libertarian, radical libertarian point of view, it's all crap, <laughs> yeah. but from a gen, you know, it's much higher than what you would find, you know, uh, in other areas. And they have a, there's so many things that I've learned from there. Um, like they have, uh, you know, subreddits on all different kinds of things, you know, from, you know, self-improvement and obscure topics and whatnot. There's an agorism subreddit. There's an ANCAP subreddit. Um, voluntarist subreddit, um, and not just libertarian stuff, non-libertarian stuff as well. Uh, and you know, just really helpful people in a lot of these communities. Um, it's, it's important to be on Reddit. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about this person who asked the question and we probably won't ever find out, but I'm curious whether he's like young and single or has a family. I mean, my advice would be different to him in, in either case. I mean, I've got two kids now and, you know, a regular job and everything. So I feel like I can't do a lot of activism. I just don't have the time for it. And, you know, mm. maybe that's a cop out to a certain extent, but I just don't know between going to work and, you know, dealing with kids and then, you know, trying to do activism on the side from that. 
And then even to the, you know, I, I can't really afford to be arrested either. You know, I can't be away from my family. Um, so, you know, if this guy's young and, you know, single, I would say, and he wants to do that kind of thing, I would certainly suggest, you know, something along those lines to him. Mm. Um, but barring that, I would say the best thing you can do, I mean, I started writing my blog just because I found some of the concepts in libertarianism interesting. And I don't know that I reached a whole lot of people. Um, but I found that interesting to do just because it taught me more about it, forced me to read about it. And then, I mean, you can argue with people on Facebook if you've got the time for it. I don't know how much, you know, that's, I mean, that's about the extent of my activism anymore. And even now I don't even have a lot of time to write on my blog anymore. Um, but you know, I argue to a certain extent with people on Facebook, but even then I've, at least the people I deal with, it seems like that doesn't even have a whole lot of effect. You know, you just end up arguing with people. (laughs) Well, there are definitely uh, quarrelsome personalities. And I think uh, one thing that I've learned over the last year is that it's very important to be selective about who you associated with, who you associate with, because there are personalities who are negative. And, you know, you'd be like, hey, this is really cool. And they'll be like on Facebook, that, that's a complete idiocy. And I'll explain why this is stupid for this reason. And I'm like, Ugh, you know, like those people you're talking about, the radicals. Oh, we can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so and, you know, like uh, whether they're correct or not, I mean, be even before you get into logic and stuff, like it's very important to maintain a positive outlook on life because you can't do anything if you're if you always have a negative outlook. And so it's absolutely essential to surround yourself with positive people. And, uh, and you know, in addition to the negative people, there are also quarrelsome people who are always looking for a fight. Um, and sometimes they're the same person. And so, you know, on Facebook <laughs> and in real life, uh, you know, I, without, you know, in an unabashed way, I say goodbye to those people. I don't, I don't want to be connected. And, and the rude people as well. The people who are condescending, who are, you know, you're like, hey, this look at this really cool idea. And so they write a comment. They're like, sigh, <laughs> you're an idiot, you know, and, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, I don't want to be associated. I don't even care if they're right or not. You know, if people can't engage in conversation with basic respect, with optimism, you know, and, and whatnot in a balanced way, then, you know, I don't want, you know, you have to get those people out of your life because they're right. poison. They're spiritual poison. But, um, you know, the, this this uh, young man, he's 17, so I doubt that he, you know, he has, he's married or has a family or anything yet. That's true. I forgot about that part. Yeah, but I, I think for somebody at that age, and th- this, this suggestion has become controversial in the libertarian community, he should absolutely go to college and dedicate himself to college. And he should go to the best college that he can get into, uh, no matter the cost, frankly. Because, um, you know, a lot of people these days say college is a waste of money, college burdens you with debt, uh, it's overpriced, et cetera, et cetera. However, I see people in the liberty community who are who haven't gone to college or who didn't finish college. And intellectually, I, you know, it's so obvious that they are uh, midgets. They have been midgetized because they haven't gone through a rigorous process of uh, learning the most important parts of human knowledge that have been collected, and they haven't gone through a rigorous process of self-examination, of writing, you know, ten or twenty-page papers every week or every two weeks or whatnot. Um, and the the that is so absolutely essential, in my opinion, to being effective at uh, activism and communications. Yeah, I, I always tell people I went into computer science specifically to avoid writing 10 and 20 page papers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a history degree at the University of Chicago, which, um, you know, is one of the, you know, then and now is in the top uh, five consistently or top five or top 10 colleges in the country. And, uh, you know, I say that not to show off, but to say that it is so important um, to get a quality college education because um you know it, and it's i see a lot of people in the community who fall into this rut this intellectual rut of repeating the same things over and over again or repeating things uncritically and it's when you're writing um you know i i had the 
it was a, a you know like a massive challenge for me for those four years to be writing so much and it yeah. is it improved my writing and improved my brain processes you know i'm uh considerably more of a critical thinker and uh you know i have the courage to stand behind that critical thinking and i think that uh that is something that is lacking both in the liberty community and outside of it uh yeah, you know, because i hate i hated I hated writing in school, but that's the reason I took up blogging was it forced me to actually do research and put pen to paper. And I, when you write it down and, you know, you actually have a opportunity to make sure that you write what you mean or say what you mean kind of thing. And mm-hmm. it's there, it's like you said, there's a certain amount of intellectual rigor that that accompanies actually sitting down and writing things out. Yeah, um, because there are, you know, but there are people in both inside the liberty community and outside who are who are not critical thinkers, and they will swallow basically anything that comes from an, an authoritative source. Um, and this is a problem. No matter what belief system you have, no matter what ends you take it to, if you are not a critical thinker, it's going to take you someplace you don't want to go eventually. You know, whether you're saying rah rah for the government or you're saying rah rah for you know unabashed liberty. Um, you know, I mean that that's that's just a basic. That's even basic to libertarianism to be you know, your own thinker. Um, yeah. I think and, that's a good place to leave it. Well, I wanted to make one more comment, which is right. after he finishes college or actually while he's doing college, he should be looking for ways, actively looking for ways to not be an employee. <laughs> and I don't want to offend you uh, with these comments, no. but, uh, that was something that I was lucky because my grandfather, uh, who uh, raised me for a good part of my life and supported me, you know, until he died about a year and a half ago, uh, he was uh, an entrepreneur and he, he was not rich by any means. Uh, at the end of his life, he was uh, the owner of a junkyard uh, and he went to work every day to work in dirt and, you know, welding and all kinds of stuff. But he was an independent guy. And that's something I learned from him. It is so, you know, your independence, your economic independence is so important because as John said, as you said, um, you know, it's when you have to work for somebody else, like you're, you don't have time to do other stuff. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that advice. And I think when you're young, you have a better chance of doing that than when you get older. Mm. So, I mean, now if you're going to try and become an entrepreneur, I mean, in my opinion, just because like I said, I'm an employee now and I've been so for, you know, 12 years, I think or so now. Um, but yeah, it's, you, it seems like the, it, you know, it seems like when you do entrepreneurship, at least, you know, like I said, I've never done it. So it seems like from what I've read, there's a lot of failure involved and it seems like you're in a better position to fail when you're younger than when you are, when you're older and have a family and kids. And some, some people want to come out of college and they want to immediately go into, uh, a really well-paying job, a nice cushy apartment, a brand new car. And, and I mean, that immediately involves debt or obligations, you know, whether that debt is a car debt or a rental agreement or whatever, because a rental agreement is basically, you know, you're taking on a debt because you commit to that six months or a year. Um, and even if you leave early, I mean, you're still liable for that. Right. So, um, you know, don't be afraid. Like when I, when I came out of college, um, I immediately went back to live with my grandfather and work in his junkyard. <laughs> I can tell you, you know, as a graduate – of what you know, one of the top universities in the country. That was uh, that shocked some of my classmates. I, <laughs> every day I went and I and I worked in his junkyard and I worked repairing pallets, and it was one of the best things that uh, I could have done. Um, and then afterwards, I rented a really crappy apartment, a shared apartment, uh, and actually lived with um, you know a drug addict, addict for a little while in um, you know a, a neighborhood that was just beginning to gentrify in Chicago. Uh, and I, you know, it's not like I couldn't get a good job. I actually was hired. Uh, I was actually headhunted by a bank in Chicago and was being, had a salary of $15,000 in 1994 or five, which was a lot, a lot of money. money. It was, a, I mean, it was decent money today. It was a lot of money then. And I had, yeah. I had an office on the 57th floor of a, uh, I forget the name of the building, but it was right you, across. Mr. Corporate America. Yeah, it was right across from that that um, very iconic first, used to be called the first Chicago building. The um, one with the big slanted point kind of at yes, the top. Yes, yes, it was right across from that one. Um, 
And I left that job because it didn't give me enough independence or enough intellectual stimulation. And I left it to drive a taxi. <sighs> nice. I drove, and you know that 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 would that would, that wasn't easy for me, and that would be impossible for a lot of people. And that's why people have to bring their egos down. Because, but it was one of the best things that I did because I got to know people from all over the world who are also taxi drivers. And I, I would go and I would park at the airport and wait an hour or so for a fare. And while I was doing that, I would read books uh, and I would, you know, generate tons of ideas. Um, and so basically my point is, you know, that's the right time to sacrifice and that's, that's the right time to take risks in search of a more independent lifestyle. And I'm lucky today um, because I don't, I don't carry a mortgage. I don't have any debt uh, and I work for myself full time. And so I have the freedom to do all kinds of things that, um, you know, and I'm not hating on John by any means. I'm not trying to embarrass <laughs> him or anything, but, um, you know, that somebody in John's position doesn't have. And it's really nice at, at, at age 42, uh, which is how old I am. It's really nice to have that. Yeah, I, I agree. That's it's where I'm trying to get to. But, you know, like I said, it's it's uh, it's going to take some time. Yeah, I mean, once you get onto that that treadmill, and you you know you have the mortgage and the debt, and you have the kids, um, it becomes a lot harder. So I think that's it. I think we're we're way we're over on time again. Yeah, we're <laughs> we're at an hour and thirty five seconds. So oh well, I think we came in just under last week at least. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, you know, if you if somebody could just check to make sure that our voicemail system and the international phone system is working, uh, give us a call at 641-715-3900, extension 255-888. And have a great day. <laughs>